Mai Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and in my last video, I talked about the concept of fate and free will in Middle Earth, and especially in light of the recently released Nature of Middle Earth, which has a section dedicated to this particular topic. And in the video, I mentioned that I was going to be eventually doing a video on the Turin to Rumbar story and how this concept relates because the Turin to Rumbar story is very heavily laden with themes of fate and free will and that sort of thing. And I wasn't planning to do it immediately, but then Girl Next Gondor released a video with almost exactly the same topic and I want to watch hers, but I also don't want her video to kind of affect the way I do my video, so I'm doing mine now so that I can get it out of the way and then watch hers and not have it affect my own analysis. So I'm going to link to her video in case you want to watch that as well. If you haven't already seen it, uh, I can't say it's good because I haven't seen it, but everything that she's done is good so far that I like, so it's probably good. And I'll also link to my previous video on the concept of fate and free will because it's going to have a lot of really important background information for this one. I'll note a few things here up front, but the really big detailed analysis is in that video. The things that I want to note here are the point that Tolkien makes in that piece in The Nature of Middle Earth is that fate is about the, quote, chances of the world, not things that are, you know, inherent to a given person's character or things like that. It's the seemingly random events that occur you know, like what Gandalf describes as a chance meeting with Thorin. It wasn't really a chance meeting because Gandalf practically tells us it wasn't really. Uh, so that's what fate is. It's not about the person's inner nature or the things that drive them. It's about things in the broader world that seem coincidental. So that's one of the key things to take away from it. Another key thing to take away from it is the idea that humans, meaning men specifically are uniquely endowed with the ability to shape their own lives within Ea, or Arda, in ways that others are not, because for them, the music of the Ainur is as fate to all else, meaning all else other than men. So that's a very key insight as well, because Turin, of course, is a man. So he has some power to shape his own destiny in ways that, say, Beleg might not have. With those two things in mind, what we're going to do is kind of look at Turin's life and the major events and things that happen and analyze whether they might be Turin's own free choice, fate, or a third thing, which I'm going to discuss, and that's the Curse of Morgoth. Let's start with that Curse of Morgoth thing because that's kind of important. The Curse of Morgoth is not what we might think of in an RPG or, you know, video game type setting as like a magic spell or a hex that Morgoth casts on Hurin's family. What happens, of course, is Morgoth, after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, captures Hurin, Turin's father, and tries to get information out of him regarding where the hidden city of Gondolin is. Hurin doesn't give it up, and he basically slaps Morgoth down verbally, and he's like, you can't do anything to me, I'm not giving it up, ha. Morgoth, of course, gets very angry, and he curses Hurin and his family. But in cursing him, he's not, like I said, casting some kind of a hex that's just going to magically make things bad for Turin. That's not what this means. The curse of Morgoth is... Morgoth is specifically going to be aiming his ill intent at Hurin and Hurin's family. Really, Hurin's family, because Hurin is already kind of trapped and can't do anything about it. So the idea that... Morgoth has cursed Turin, Morwen, Neonor, all these different characters, is not, I hereby curse you, and then just bad things happen magically. That's not what it is. Morgoth is cursing them in the sense that he is going to be directing his own ire at these individual people and making bad things happen to them because that's his goal. That is what the curse of Morgoth in this particular scenario means. So when I refer to the curse of Morgoth, I am not referring to magically bad things just happen because Morgoth at one point cast a spell. 
that's not what that is. So wanted to clear that up at the beginning. So now let's take a look at some of the major events in Turin's life and take a look at it through the lens of these three different facets that are really kind of always interweaving throughout his story. So the earliest thing that really happens to Turin that really shapes his character for the rest of the story is when he's still a child and before Hurin has even gone off and gotten himself captured in the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. It's the plague that sweeps through Hithlum and other areas and that kills his other sister, the one that we don't really know much of anything about because she dies so early. He's very affected by her death because A, it's his first experience with death, but also the way his family reacts to it is very, very severe, you might say. Morwen is his mother, is very, very grieved at this. So is Hurin. Hurin and Mor Morwen have very different outlooks on life. Hurin is much more of an optimist, Morwen much more of a pessimist. And there's a lot of how that plays out, but there was also a nurse, or I think she was a nurse, I can't remember exactly her role, but another person in the, the household that basically kind of also put a lot of weight on the fact that, you know, the fact that his sister died and we should take this very seriously. So Morwen, being the pessimist that she is, places a lot of weight on it as well and kind of takes the approach of, you know, like, there's no more laughter here. Her name had been La Life, meaning laughter, or maybe that was her nickname. Regardless, it's it's a very sombering event, not just in the sense of Turin is more somber as a result, but it's like Morwen almost imposes a much more serious attitude on things as a result of this event. So that has long-lasting effects out into the future. What this event categorizes as is really most obviously just fate, if it's going to be anything at all. Because Morgoth has not yet directed his ire at Turin and his family. He's just kind of doing this as a general, I'm trying to kill off my enemies, so I'm going to create this plague, and that's how it happens. So the extent to which any of this affects Turin is a fate thing, not a Morgoth's curse thing, and certainly not a free will thing. None of his actions here are really relevant to what occurs. Next major event that happens, of course, is Hurin gets captured. And this, of course, has a huge effect on his life because Morwen, as a result, will end up sending him to Doriath to be raised by King Thingol. And this also has a huge impact on his outlook because for the rest of the story, Turin is going to be obsessed by the idea of his mother being stuck in Hithlum in a bad way, and he wants to remedy that. And a lot of what he does for the rest of the story is going to come back to that issue. Now, Hurin's capture, of course, is more like a fate thing, and it's also partially driven by Hurin's own free will choice to be kind of the last standing, you know, rear guard to help uh, Turgon get out and back to Gondolin. But it's also just kind of a general fate thing because the battle just goes really badly and it's not Morgoth's curse because he's not cursing anybody yet. Again, this is before all that. But then Morwen sending Turin away is very much Morwen's free choice and that is that that one thing, if she hadn't sent him away that would have been a very different character-building moment for him. Now, other bad things might have occurred to him as a result, but ultimately the fact that he goes, that's not a result of Morgoth's curse, although you might argue Morgoth in the background is trying to instigate the, the men who now rule over Morwen and the rest of Turin's people to treat them more and more harshly, but we don't get any indication of that in the story, so it's really hard to peg to that. And even if we could, that's, you know, it's not like they weren't already treating him bad anyway. So Morwen's free will choice here really seems to be kind of the driving thing. And it determines a ton of Turin's future actions. Once in Doriath, or on the way to Doriath, he ends up being found by Beleg, Beleg Kuthalian. And this you might call a fate thing, because... 
him and his two uh, guides who were helping him get there almost died of starvation because the whole point of Doriath is that you can't get in. More, uh, not more. When Melian has set up the Melian's girdle, which bewilders anybody trying to get in. The only person who ever got in that wasn't asked in basically was Baron, and then Karkaroth after that. So them find, being found by Beleg is certainly more of a fate thing. And the fact that he makes it, therefore, is kind of fate. You know, like his destiny is he's going to survive and he's going to do things. Then the next really big thing that happens is he gets old enough to where he can actually start to wield weapons and fight in battles and things like that. And as soon as he is of age to do this, and by of age I mean 17, but he's also an abnormally tall and strong human, so I mean he's a, you know, even at 17 he would have been probably a very formidable fighter. And especially being trained by somebody like Beleg, who had centuries or even millennia of experience. So he ends up doing that, and that's his own free will choice there. And while in Doriath, the curse of Morgoth is really kind of inactive because Morgoth can't really accomplish a whole lot while he's there because the Melian's girdle and there's just nothing that he can do other than try to conquer Doriath, which is kind of beyond what he can accomplish at that point in, in the story. So Turin has this free will choice that he uses to go out and fight with Beleg on the marches, and this starts to make him more, you know, in that mode. This again goes back to that decision that he's he's got this obsession with trying to make things easier on Morwen and hopefully get her to come to Doriath. Morwen, of course, is not and will not for a long time. And by the time she does, it's really too late because Turin will have already left. After going to the marches, at one point, Turin comes back to the main halls of Menegroth and by chance, we might say, or by fate, sits in the seat of a particular elf, Cyrus, who is none too fond of humans, let's say, and especially not very fond of Turin. They have their exchange where he makes fun of the women of Hithlum and Turin chucks a cup in his face and, you know, hurts him pretty bad. And then the next day, Cyros comes and tries to catch him at unawares and kill him, but Turin gets the upper hand, makes him strip naked, and then runs him through the forest. And then at some point, Cyros gets to a chasm and he's like, well, Turin's going to kill me, so I'm just going to jump and try to make it. And he doesn't make it. Turin actually wasn't going to make him jump. He was just going to let him go at that point. But... There we see Turin acting with, you know, it's impulsive, but there's still a certain amount of, you know, you have to attribute some degree of free will to it because, so the, you know, casting the cup in Cyrus's face, you could say is not really a free will action. It's just the impulse acting out of anger at Cyrus's taunting and therefore, nah, not really free will because if you go back to that fate and free will video I mentioned one of the things that Tolkien says is that a free will action really has to be about a conscious purpose. Turin is probably not consciously purposing, like, I want to break this guy's face with a cup. It's more like, I am mad at you and I'm just reacting out of anger. But the stripping him, you know, making him strip and then run naked through the forest, that's, you know, Turin at that point was acting out of something like malice. So we can attribute that to free will. And it's because of the events that this leads to that Turin eventually leaves Doriath. And his leaving Doriath sets up so many other things in this story. He misses Morwen when she finally arrives. He ends up getting into a band of outlaws. And there's just multiple different things. Now, in the midst of all this, of course, there is the dragon helm of Dor Loman, And that becomes Turin's at some point. And what how that happens is not really important, but it becomes kind of a signifying thing about him that makes him identifiable. And this is where the Curse of Morgoth is going to come into play. After Turin spends a lot of time with the outlaws, Beleg comes and tries to find him because he's been pardoned by Thingol, who, having heard about the full events, wants to have him brought back and say, you're pardoned, even though it was kind of messed up what you did. You were kind of justified because Cyrus was being a jerk. So... 
Balig goes out to find him, and he takes the dragon helm of Norloman, and he takes the black sword that was forged by Aeol, the Dark Elf, and takes those and tries to find Turin. And he eventually does, and he gives the the helm to Turin at some point. He doesn't give him the black sword because Balig is using that, but he will eventually come to possess the black sword. And this is another identifying thing that makes Turin identifiable to the enemies of elves and men. And in fact, one of the key themes throughout a lot of this story is that Hurin, I mean, Turin will remain kind of incognito or unnamed, and then something will, he'll do something usually to kind of reveal himself and out himself, and then Morgoth's like, aha, I got you now, and then starts trying to mess with him again. And one of the ways that this happens, when he comes to the outlaws, he takes an assumed name. He doesn't give him himself his proper name. And he lives with the outlaws for a while, and then only when Baleg comes does he stop living a life as just a regular outlaw, robbing from just anybody. He then turns his attention to, okay, we're just going to fight orcs from now on. And this becomes kind of the first outing that he makes, because once he starts actively pursuing orcs and trying to hinder Morgoth specifically, rather than just being an outlaw who doesn't care who he's robbing from... This is when it becomes kind of clear who he is. He ends up with the Dragon Hill of Norloman, which had been Hurin's, so that kind of identifies him. And just his prowess as well makes him a target for Morgoth. And so what ends up happening, Morgoth will end up sending a lot of, basically a huge army to find him, and they eventually get a betrayal in which he makes a, one of the, he's, his position is betrayed, and so they get ambushed and taken, and Baleg is left for dead, although he isn't, and Turin is taken captive, because Morgoth's like, aha, I got you now, now I'm going to make the rest of your life miserable. Doesn't want him dead, he just wants to make his life miserable, and that's really easy to do if you're a captive in Angband, and not so easy to do if he's out there wandering who knows where under what a, who knows what assumed name. So... That's where Morgoth's curse really first starts kicking in in a heavy way is this particular ambush and capture of Turin. Baleg recovers and eventually goes after him, but in the process of trying to rescue him, meets Gwyndor. And this is clearly a fate thing. He just like happens ac across Gwyndor, who's an escapee from Angband. And together they try to rescue Turin, and they succeed, except for the fact that when Baleg tries to cut the chains off of Turin he nicks him with the blade of the black sword and wakes up Turin, who then kills Baleg, thinking that he's an enemy. This is, again, you can't really call this free will, but the accidental pricking, that seems kind of like a fate thing, too. So on the one hand, he meets Gwyndor, seemingly by chance or fate, and then he pricks uh, Turin by either chance or fate, both of which actions have dramatic consequences later because Gwyndor will take him to Nargothrond which he ends up completely ruining by having them build a bridge and becoming less stealthy and actually engaging in more open warfare. Really dumb ideas both. Um, but also the fact that he kills Baleg and then you know he, he takes the black sword as his own weapon which becomes his an identifying mark that makes him easier to find by Morgoth because he keeps using it and people eventually are like, oh, there's this guy with his black sword over there. And Morgoth's like, ha, I gotcha. So he eventually becomes very well regarded in Nargothrond. And, well, it's really Nargothrond, I suppose. I can't really ever decide based on the pronunciation rules where that emphasis should fall. Anyway, he becomes very well regarded and one of the highest counselors there. That's how he ends up convincing everybody to build the bridge. And this again goes back to that whole idea of I'm trying to make things harder on Morgoth and therefore easier on my mother so that she can make it to Doriath. She, by the way, has already made it to Doriath at some point around here, but Turin is gone. Well, she may not have made it there quite yet. That may be after the dragon actually, dragon Glaurung and his army take Nargothrond. And that's what happens, because Turin, through his own you know, purpose, his very conscious purpose of trying to wage open warfare because he doesn't like stealth. And the fact that he keeps wearing the dragon helm and using the black sword 
and therefore identifying himself to Morgoth, who, by the way, was looking for Nogathrond anyway and was happy to find it and be able to destroy it, Glaurung shows up with an army, wipes out the elvish city of Nargothrond, and Turin is then kind of magicked into a trance. Glaurung lies to him, basically saying, you know, you here you are living in luxury, and your mom and sister are over there in Hithlum living like slaves, basically. Aren't you a great son? Uh, and so he then tries to follow after the idea of rescuing them, whereas... What he really probably should have done was gone after Fendulos, the daughter of the king of Nargothrond, who Gwyndor had told him, like, if you can, if you can save her and, and, you know, get out of here, then she might help you avoid your curse. But otherwise, you're kind of doomed. Not really clear why or why not that might have worked. One wonders if it has something to do with the idea if he had settled down with Finduilas, he would have been content and therefore not continued to out himself and make himself a giant target in the map of Middle-earth. <laughs> but for whatever reason, that's Gwyndor's advice to him. But he doesn't follow it because Glaurung basically fools him into thinking that he really needs to go do this other thing. So he goes and tries to rescue Morwen from Hithlum, and finds that she's already gone, and she's made it to Doriath at some point. He gets into a lot of trouble in Hithlum, which, again, how much of that is impulsivity versus free will choices? Unclear, but most of what happens there doesn't have a huge effect on the story. The point, really, is that his next step is, I'm not going to go back to Doriath. Everywhere I go gets ruined, so I'm just going to hide out somewhere, see if I can find Fendulas and not bother my parent, my mom and my sister, because that'll probably just ruin their lives. Not realizing that the only reason he keeps ruining people's lives is because he's doing stupid things like having bridges built in what was supposed to be a secret city and ha having them engage in open warfare, right? So he goes and tries to find Fendulas, and he eventually comes to an area where he finds a group of men fighting some orcs. He helps kill the orcs, and then it turns out that these men who live in Brethil... Uh, they actually had just buried Fendulas not too awful long ago because they had tried to ambush the orcs who were taking Fendulas and the other elves from Nargothrond to Ungbond, but they killed all the captives, and so Fendulas died and said, if the Mormagil comes, meaning Turin, because he was called Mormagil after the Black Sword, because Mormagil means Black Sword, again, identifying information. I mean, it's like Turin just gives out his social security number to everybody. It's That's, that's kind of how stupid it is. Um... So he, by chance, runs into these people and thus, by chance, find out that Fendulas had died there. So he decides, you know what, I'm just going to stick with these people. I'm going to, you know, put aside the black sword and the dragon helm and I'm just going to use the spear and the bow and do what I can for these people and, you know, try to put my past behind me. And again, he's using, even in Nargothrond and here, he's using assumed names. Now, his true identity always comes out in some way. Gwyndor knew who he was and eventually outs his identity to um, Fendulas at one point. And here, you know, they kind of surmise who he is, but they just call him this other name so as to hide his identity. He lives there for a while. Meanwhile, unfortunately, Morwen and Fendulas, I mean, not Fendulas, Morwen and his sister Neonor have decided, well, we're going to go find him. Well, Morwen decides this, and then Neonor comes along, even though Morwen doesn't want to. And they try to find him with the help of some of Thingol's men and come to Nargothron. They want to scout it out, see if they can find out what's happened to him. Thingol is against this, by the way, as he should be. None of this would have happened, of course, if he had actually just gone to Doriath and been like, Hi, Mom, I'm, I'm here. And then she wouldn't have had to leave to go find him. So again, his rather conscious purpose in not going creates this issue. She then goes, and unfortunately Glaurung, who's, who is still hanging out in Nargothrond, sitting on a giant heap of treasure, like some other dragons we know, uh, drives away most of the elves and magics Neonor into forgetting everything, and Morwen is carried off by a horse who knows where. Neonor then, by chance or by fate, uh, ends up in Brethil, and Turin and a company of men find her. Not knowing who she is, because she wasn't even born when he left Hithlum, they take her in and eventually 
he ends up asking her to marry him. She hangs back at first because she's seen, she feels like something's not right with this. It's, you know, it, it's her inner self telling her, that's your brother, that's gross. Uh, but at any rate, eventually she gives in. But the problem is more and more orcs are starting to come through and attack because they know that there's this ambush party out there somewhere in the woods of Brethil and they want to get rid of them. And so Turin, who had agreed for her sake to kind of back off of the war-making life entirely, you know, he had been just using the spear and bow, now he starts doing it again. And he starts using the black sword again, flashing that social security number out there for everybody to see. <laughs> so, of course, Morgoth now knows, hey, I found him again. Let me go send Glaurung after him and mess him up another time. And so, of course, Glaurung does come, and he, you know, very deliberately attacks Brethil. And here, this, this is one of the more interesting parts, too, because he, he devises this plan. Here's how we're going to kill Glaurung. We're going to mimic how Sigmund killed Fafnir. He doesn't say it in those terms, but the idea is he's going to be in a chasm at the bottom of which is a river and a lot of rocks uh, and wait under it, and then when Glaurung passes overhead, just stick him in the belly. And he, at one point, he even says, like, there's no guarantee he's going to cross here, but when all rests on chance, to chance we must trust. Chance or fate? Not really clear. But anyway, so he has this plan, and he carries it out rather successfully. He manages to kill Glaurung. Unfortunately, when he finishes Glaurung off, he comes up after Glaurung has finished, like, thrashing around and beating down trees, and he comes to get his black sword back, uh, because he wants to keep identifying himself in the future, apparently. Uh, and he takes the sword out and a bunch of venom gets his hand and it burns his hand so bad that he swoons because he's already exhausted and, you know, it, it's just been a hard day. Well, then Neonor comes along because Neonor can't stand to be separated from him. Who's She's going by a different name, by the way. It's not really obvious who she is just because her name is Neonor, in case you're not familiar with the story. But at any rate... She comes along, Glaurung still has a little bit of life left in him, and she re he reveals to her, here's who you are, and that's your brother, and in life grand, and then he dies. Meanwhile, Brondir, who was the leader of the Woodmen before Turin kind of took over that role because everybody liked him better, uh, he overhears all this, and then he sees that, she, that uh, Neonor, being called a, a different name, is like, oh my, I am carrying my brother's child. And she goes and just hurls herself off the ravine into the rocky river below. And that's the last we know of her. Brondir, of course, is super depressed. And then, so, I mean, by chance, he overheard all this, right? By chance or fate. Turin eventually wakes up, comes back, and he's asking after Neonor. And then Brondir kind of tells him what happened. Turin, of course, thinks that he's just lying, trying to make him feel bad, because there's always been a little bit of animosity between them, because he, Brondir, also loved Neonor. So he ends up killing Brondir. And then, to top it all off, by chance or fate, the same elves who had been helping Morwen and Neonor find uh, out what happened to Turin in Nargothrond come through and find Turin after he's killed Brondir and kind of run off on his own and inform him that they were searching for Morwen and Neonor and he realizes, oh shoot, Brondir was right. And then he runs off and he stabs himself with the black sword thinking, you know what? It's been a bad run and let's not make it any worse. So there's all these events that we can see you know, the the curse of Morgoth many times being applied pretty much purely through the, the intervention of Glaurung. Like, Glaurung messes with Turin's head, he messes with Neonor's head, and then he tries to attack Turin again, and, you know, messes with Neonor's head a second time so that she kills herself, so that Turin ends up killing himself. But there's also a lot of chance and fate events, because when they when he meets people, when he, you know, when certain things happen... A lot of it is meetings, like when Beleg meets Gwyndor, when Beleg even finds Turin with the outlaws, When and that's not entirely fake, because Beleg's a good tracker, and he's, you know, that's what he does. Um, you know, when he meets uh, uh, 
the elves who come and basically tell them, oh, you just killed your sister. Uh, not killed your sister, but directly, but kind of like because you married her and then, yeah, that's complicated. So many weird things happen kind of by chance, seemingly. But also, most of the screw-ups are just Turin being kind of a jerk. Um, some of his attitude toward a lot of this is based on his past life and the ways in which that informed his character. But building the bridge at Nargothrond, leading the uh, outlaws in kind of a deliberate war against orcs, taking up the Black Sword and the Helm of Dor Loman again and again, things like this where he's very deliberately going out of his way to do things in order to accomplish, mostly, like I said, the goal of making life easier on Morwen so that maybe she can make it to somewhere safe. That's what really tends to lead to most of the bad things happening. The Curse of Morgoth is pretty much always inactive right up until Turin does something stupid to reveal who he is and where he is, and then Morgoth, you know, most of the time, basically just sends Glaurung out to go to go hunt him down. Not always Glaurung, you know, with the, when he's captured the first time, that's just orcs. Um, and so apart from that, like, in most of the chance meetings, they set up where he ends up and, and things like that, but they don't really affect how the story plays. Like, meeting Gwyndor is how he ends up, you know, end up going to Nargothrond, but it doesn't have anything to do with what he does at Nargothrond. That's kind of all on him. And then what he does in Nargothrond is what results in Nargothrond being completely sacked. And it's, you know, I mean, like, all these different chance meetings and, and things that happen by luck or whatever, like his, his sitting in Cyrus's seat by chance and getting him all peeved, is what ends up creating their tension that leads to the fight that leads him to leave Doriath in the first place. But it's his own decision after he's already beaten him in single combat when Cyrus tried to uh, ambush him that, you know, to, to humiliate him even further that leads to him dying. Like, that didn't have to happen. You know, if it had just ended at the, the, meet, the dinner at the hall or if, you know, if he had just beaten him when he tried to ambush him and been like, you know what, I'd really like to do some more to you, but just get up and get out of here. He would have been in Doriath the whole time, and eventually maybe Morwen would have made it to Doriath herself, and they could have all been a happy family. Like, it's always Turin's dumb decisions leading to the bad outcomes. So at the end of the day there is this really, really complex interplay of multiple things that drive this narrative forward. The fake chance meetings and things like that determine a lot of the context for Turin's choices. And a lot of the, the curse of Morgoth is what, you know, forces him into different scenarios and force him to make decisions that he might not otherwise make. But his decisions themselves are often what allow for the Curse of Morgoth to find its target. And if, if not for that, then many of the events that occur would not have happened. The fall of Dargothrond, you know, the various, you know, the ambush that got him captured the first time. You know, just so many different things. And even Glaurung coming and attacking the Woodmen of Brethil. So, all three play a very integral role in determining how Turin's story falls out. But if I had to put the most weight on any one thing, it's definitely Turin's own free will. And this goes back to that, that part in the Ainulindale where it says, men will, to men I will give a new gift and they will be able to shape their own destinies. Turin may have ended up in places kind of by chance or fate, and he might have ended up in situations by chance or fate, but it's his own conscious purposes that tend to make the biggest events in this story happen. And so, much as I like the story of Turin Turumbar, you can't really give him a whole lot of credit as a person. I mean, he, he just, he tends to be kind of dumb. He's very rash and reckless, and he has kind of a means justify the ends or ends justify the means kind of mentality about him. His entire 
purpose in life almost is to protect his mom and his sister and get them in a good situation. But his choices in how to go about accomplishing that are almost invariably bad and stupid. They involve so much... And, and, and the crazy thing about it is it's so backward because he intentionally will go by assumed names in order to hide from the curse of Morgoth. And Gwyndor will even tell him at one point, it's not your name that's the problem, it's you. And Gwyndor was both right and wrong because if he had kept the... if he had con carried out to the logical conclusion the point of taking an assumed name... It actually would have been fine, because if he doesn't start using the black sword, and he doesn't wear the dragon helm of Dor Loman, and he doesn't behave like Turin behaves, then he actually does fly under the radar, and Morgoth never finds a way to pursue him. There's actually a point in the story where it says that Morgoth's like, where is this guy? I can't make my curse come home to him if, if I don't know where he is, and that's not good. That's, that's defeating my purposes here. So, and that's why I say Morgoth's curse is not just this magic spell that hate happily takes effect whenever it has the opportunity. No, it's like Morgoth has to know where he is. So when Gwyndor says that, he is right, he's, he's wrong in the sense that Turin changing his name is actually a good thing. But he's right in the sense that, well, the problem is Turin. The problem is Turin can change his name all day long, but if he keeps throwing himself out there in ways that identify him better than his own name then what good does it do to change your own name? It does him no good at all. And it's it's really kind of hilarious in a, in a sad, twisted kind of way just how stupid Turin is in this, in this sense because Turin, on the one hand, recognizes I need to be incognito. I don't want Morgoth to know where I am. And then as soon as he pretends to be incognito by changing his name, he goes out there and flashes the social security card meaning the dragon helm and the black sword by, you know, so, I mean, he's just like, hi, my name is Joe Schmo, and I just happen to possess these relics that only one other person in the world has really ever possessed at the same time, and yeah, that, that means I'm that person. It's just, it's so weird the way that he, he does that. It's like on the one hand, he has this good instinct, but he can't, he can't bring himself to carry it through to its logical conclusion. Because he's so focused on that idea of, I want Morwen to get out of Hithlum, and I want her to be okay, and I will do whatever I have to do to accomplish that. Even if it means defeating the very purpose of changing my name so that nobody knows who I am. So, anyway, that that's my analysis of the story of Turin Turumbar. There's obviously a lot more detail you could get into. I mean, even, like, especially in the... In the, the standalone novel published by Christopher Tolkien where there's, you know, the Children of Hurin stuff from the Unfinished Tales all put together into one giant narrative. There's more detail. There's a lot more you could analyze, but I, that would take so long to get in all that detail. I just can't do it. But there's so many things about this story where all these different elements weave together and result in all this stuff. If you think that I've missed out on any really big key ones, you know, leave those in the comments below. I was trying to do just kind of the broad overview look at everything. But if there's anything you think that I should have mentioned that I didn't put them in the comments, um, certainly there are some I did not mention. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it around. Don't forget to check out Girl Next Gondor's video, which will probably be different in its approach a little bit based on the title. I don't know that because I still haven't seen it. Um, and watch my fate and free will if you haven't yet, because even if you watch this one first, that other one, it's really interesting because of what Tolkien tells us in there. So do all of that. Uh, if you want to catch more of my content, subscribe, of course, and click the bell icon to make sure you catch all the notifications. I also have Odyssey and Rumble channels, and I have podcast versions of these as well, and you can support me over at Patreon. And follow me at Twitter at JRRT Lore for occasional Tolkien related trivia questions. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namarie.